Hawks on the Wire is a podcast produced by Three Hawks Haven, an e-card company where love, kindness, and connection are designed in each e-card. The story you're about to hear, shared by Joan's guest, will be a story from someone's life, their personal experience. By learning from stories just like this, Three Hawks Haven is able to create beautiful and moving e-cards that can really touch someone's heart. In times of celebration or in the tougher times of life, Three Hawks Haven has e-cards for most any occasion, including some you just can't find anywhere else. You can shop for all their e-cards by going to their website, threehawkshaven.com. Now to Hawks on the Wire with your host, Joan. Hi, and welcome to Hawks on the Wire podcast. Today we are ta- talking to Pat Ferguson, and she is going to tell us the story of how she found out later in life that her father was not really her biological father. Pat herself is a mother of two, a grandmother of six, and a great-grandmother of five. She has been in the career of editing for the past 10 years. Also, she is treasurer of her church, Louisville Center for Spiritual Living, and she is also on the board for the Spiritual Center. So, Pat, how are you doing, beautiful lady? I'm doing fine, and it's my pleasure to be here to talk to you, Joan. Thank you so much. And This is just an incredible story. I'm just very excited for our listeners to hear this. So I guess we want to just kind of talk a little bit about your mom and uh, how you found out that your dad was not your biological father. Well, um, when I was 46 years old, it was 1996, my dad had a stroke and uh, he was in the hospital for about a week before he passed on Thanksgiving morning, 1996. Um, And my mother, who had been sick for many years, uh, not well for many years, and hadn't gone out of the house, uh, basically left everything up to me because she wasn't emotionally or mentally, uh, physically able to do the funeral stuff, and I did all that. We got through it. Uh, My dad had taken care of everything for her, uh, groceries, the house cleaning. He had done all of it for them, and so I took that over uh, when he passed because she basically stayed to be her same person. What I didn't know uh, for three years after he passed she had been calling doctors and had been able to sweet talk them into giving her some pretty heavy uh, drugs because she said she had told them her husband died and she needed them for her nerves. You know, she goes back to the period where there was nerve problem. So she did um, get a lot of this from doctors she wasn't seeing until all of a sudden they all decided they weren't going to give it to her and she crashed when she had no more i this i did not know because she was having neighbors pick them up because she knew i would question it yes and she so when clarify she lived in her own house you lived in yes your house, but you lived rather close together geographically yes we just lived five houses apart yes okay. So she was having neighbors pick up those prescriptions. I didn't even know she was taking them. When they were taken away from her after three years, she really had an emotional and mental breakdown. And I came to deliver her groceries and she called me by another name and asked me how my mom was doing. And I realized she didn't know who I was. So... I got her a doctor appointment, got her to the doctor. He immediately admitted her 
to the geriatric session, uh, section of uh, Norton's. And from there, she got worse and worse till she was just, just almost not a person anymore. She was just a ball of nerves and anxiety. She saw things, heard things. She thought people were being tortured and killed. So she went into a nursing home and was like this for 10 months. After 10 months, she started leveling out. They got her medication back on track. She was never the same person, but she was seeing a psychiatrist as well. And the psychiatrist told her that she had to get this story off of her chest. So me being an only child, I was the only one coming to see her. And uh, she told me at that point, uh, she told me a lot of things, but the main thing that stuck with me the most was that my father was not my biological father. And then after that stunning revelation, my first question, who is? The answer to that question was even, uh, hurt me even more because she didn't remember his name. She actually, it was a short fling and he was a friend of a friend and she said, we called him Stuart, but I don't know if that was his first name or his last name. I don't remember. She didn't remember how to spell it. Mm -hmm. So that is all the information she had on him, other than the fact that he was married and he had two children. And when she told him she was pregnant, he, he told her that he was so sorry, but he could not leave his family. And so that just kind of left her at 22 years old on her own. Wow. And this was back in what year? 1950. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, that would be so hard for your mom. So hard. Yeah, it was hard. And I'm sure uh, she, she was determined she was going to do it but I'm sure she was very worried about how it was going to happen. Um, I had asked her when she told me that my father was not my biological father. I said, did daddy know this? And she said, yes. And then she told me the story, how she met my dad and he was a soldier at Fort Knox and she was a waitress at a, a Louisville cafe. And he would come in every time he had time off and sit in her section. And he was smitten with her. Oh, and she that. just thought he was, you know, just a, a nice young man. But as it became obvious that she was pregnant, he asked her about it. And um, he still came and he still sat in her section. And eventually, he said, if you will let me, I will take care of you and your baby forever. Wow. And she was probably about, I want to say, seven months pregnant then. And she said, I said, yes. Mm -hmm. And so he did. And uh, I think it was like a month later, he was shipped off to Korea. And a month after that, I was born. Wow. And so he, she told me that his biggest fear in life was that I was going to find out that he was not my biological father and that I wouldn't love him. And, but all I can say about that is I love him and respect him even more for what he did. Yes. That's a beautiful story. It's a little bit of a love story for yeah. sure. And Oh, yes, a beautiful story. How, how did you feel? Let's go back when you're, you were at the bedside there. Your mom was in the nursing home at that time? Yes. She told you. And this was part of her healing, wasn't it? To tell you all this that had been on her, I guess, her mind and her heart for so many years. But how did you feel, Pat? 
Um, <clears throat> well, it, it was kind of like uh, a death in a way because I had all kinds of emotions. I was in shock at first. Uh, I then I got angry. Um, I was sad. Uh, I just. I didn't know what to feel because all of a sudden I realized my entire life had been a lie. My entire life, <laughs> the people I thought were related to me on my father's side <clears throat> weren't really even uh, family, blood family. But I mean, not that I don't love them just the same, but they weren't related to me and the people the background of those people that i thought was my background was not and my mother had left her family when she was a very young teenager and never saw them again and so i knew nothing about her family because she hadn't seen them since she was very young and i was at the time she told me 50 years old and looking at the fact that other than my mother, I knew nothing about my background on either side. And I was upset that she wouldn't have the forethought to think and re remember who he was in case he was needed for some medical emergency. So I had a lot of issues at first. Um, I had to quickly settle myself down and realized that I was not helping her if she was going to remember anything by being tense with her. So I, we came, she would ask me, I hope you don't hate me, or she'd say that, and I'd say, no, I don't hate you. I just want you to remember more so you can tell me. And it had to have been a shock, and you were the only child. You didn't have siblings, you know, to kind of, bounce this stuff off right it was a shock it was it was it all I can the easiest way to say it is it will mess you up <laughs> to hear yeah. that and for a while it affected me in ways that I wasn't even aware of then but um, I I started uh, buying things I didn't need ordering things just almost as a filler to, for this void I was feeling inside. And uh, I didn't tell a lot of people. I told my children, my two children, because it affected them. And uh, But I didn't tell a lot of people, just a few close friends, and because I didn't have much to tell them other than my mother. <laughs> had done me wrong is the way I felt about it at that time. And uh, so I did my best to get through things, but I gained a lot of weight. Um, I was just trying to feel, feel some hole that I felt I had now. Something was missing and I needed something put in there. So I was buying things, bringing, I didn't even take them out of the bag when I brought them home or open the boxes when they were delivered. I just collected them and it was just something I did that gave me a momentary pleasure and took my mind off what I was thinking about. So it, it was a heavy situation emotionally for me. So how did you move forward with this? Who did you end up talking to that, you know, helped you? Well, <clears throat> I talked to, uh, I have a long time, I guess, significant other is uh, the way to put it at my age, um, Kevin. And he would talk me through different things. I talked to my mother about any of her friends who might have known my biological father. And I looked those people up. Um, but every time I would get close to getting to one, I would hit a roadblock. like. I couldn't find them or they had just passed. Um, it was amazing how close I would get and then they would be taken away completely. So I really did not have 
anyone to verify any information whatsoever and to try to find out a little more until 2017. That was uh, basically 17 years after she told me, because it was 2000, the beginning of 2000 when she gave me this information. So for 17 years, I just wandered through this territory, not knowing what to do. And very, obviously this was very important to you. This was like part of your identity, I guess to say, that you really wanted to know who your biological father was because of your identity. Yes, I, I, I made up my mind immediately that I didn't really care. I had a father in my mind, but I didn't care if I had a relationship with this man, but I wanted to know his background. Was he German or French or Italian? I wanted to know those things. I wanted to know uh, his children, not to have a relationship, but just to know that I had siblings and where they might be. Um, I, I wanted some information on my grandparents, just so that I knew who I was. The relationship was secondary in my mind, to have a relationship. I just wanted to know who I was. Because you had had a father. Yes. That was a very important, yes, I understand. Yes. Um, so in 2017 for Christmas, Kevin gave me a DNA test. In 2000, those were around, but they were very expensive. But by 2017, the average person could take one. And it's just a saliva test. And so I took this, it was called 23andMe. And I took this test and waited. It took about six weeks to get the results. And suddenly it threw me over a thousand names of people who were all different variations of cousins, first cousins, second cousins, third, lots of wow. third, fourth and fifth cousins. Over a thousand, wow. Over a thousand. And I looked for the name Stewart because that's all I had to go on. And of all these people, I think there were only two Stewarts in the whole bunch. And they were like fourth or fifth cousins. And to be honest, when you see those results, you don't know at that time which side of your family they're on. They could have, that could have been a married name on my mother's side or, or someone on my mother's side oh, with that. I had not so, thought. Yes. Uh, I was still, I sat and looked at those often. I still had nowhere to go. And then out of the clear blue, one day I got a message on that site, 23andMe, from someone who was uh, shown as my third cousin. And it was just about the BRCA2 gene uh, and breast cancer. And she was contacting people in our line to find out if it was prevalent in their family. And her last name was Vincent. And I didn't, uh, know which side she was on but I went and I looked her profile up and some people have a lot of information in their profiles there but some people have none they just have their name and their sex mm -hmm. and or gender I'm sorry and they know um, they know the information but they don't release it so but this particular person had tons of it and one of the surnames listed in her uh, family tree was Stuart. So I answered her question about the uh, BRCA2 gene and told her we had none in our family. And I asked her, uh, I told her then why I was on 23andMe that I was looking for my biological father. And I noticed that one of the surnames she had in her family tree was Stuart. And 
so I asked her about that. Come to find out she has a huge family tree that she's done. Uh, and Stuart was the family name of her grandmother. And so she has traced that back for generations and generations. And she loves doing it. And she just ran with this. She said, let me help you. I can help you try to figure this out if it's if it's a steward. And awesome. so she That's just awesome. kept chipping away yes. until she found a group of men that were about the right age from various branches of the steward tree. And she just kept going through them until she eliminated it down to two brothers. And those two brothers, she said, I feel certain this is going to work out. So she had me take the uh, Ancestry.com DNA test to see if we could get hits on there that weren't on 23andMe. Because some people will take Ancestry. It's the better known of the DNA uh, test. Well, she was going to compare. She was going to compare the results. Yes. Okay. She was hoping there would be someone in that line that would be closer than a second cousin. I had a first cousin appear on my 23andMe, but it turned out to be someone on my mother's side. Okay. Uh, so we did that, and there was the person who came up highest on my list as far as percentage of relationship was an Emily Stewart. And the DNA showed her to be either a first cousin or a half niece. So we had to try to find her. We found her, she found, I, did, I really was just sitting back here praying for her because she knew what she was doing and I didn't. She found her, talked to her, and she put her on to a man named Daryl Stewart, her uncle, because she said he knew a lot about the family DNA, our uh, family tree. And uh, LaDonna talked to her, or talked to him, and she called me and she said, I think this is it. He is, I think this, he's going to be your cousin or your half brother. Oh. So she said, she said, honey, the ball's in your park now. You, it's up to you. You're going to have to call him. And she said, he's very nice. He, you know, he's very friendly. So it, it'll be okay. So she gave me his email and uh, I looked at it for two weeks before I had the nerve to call. I still, that was a big deal. Huge. What Just were you thinking? Huge. Yeah, tell me, what were you thinking during those two? You were weighing the pros and the cons? Oh, yes. I, I was fully aware that when he realized that I needed information to find out who my biological father was, that he might not want to have anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. And this is Daryl. Daryl's his name. Daryl. Daryl. Yes. Stewart. And he, you knew that if you went through with this, he would need to do the DNA test. Yes. Yeah. And so after I got my courage up, I sent him an email and told him I was looking for my biological father. And I, I didn't want to say I thought his father might be um i just said it's possible that your uncle james stewart was um my father but i don't know and i said would you be interested in would you talk to me uh about the stewart family a little bit and so he immediately answered i was still sitting at my computer 20 minutes later when I got an email from him and he said, sure, no problem. He said, call me anytime. I, I don't go out a whole lot, so I'll be here. He sent me his phone number. I called him immediately and we had about a 45 minute conversation. And he told me lots about the Stewart family and his uncle James. And 
he told me a little about his father, even though I didn't specifically ask about that because I didn't want to upset them. The last thing I wanted to do was to blow someone's image of a sweet uncle or a father by saying they might have a love child, basically. And so I was very sensitive to that. And I, I want to say that over the 17, 18, 19 years that I worked on this, I also uh, said a little prayer often that whatever I find out, however it comes to me, because I knew I didn't have the expertise to bring it to me, however it comes to me, I just hope that whatever I find out and the people that I talk to are not harmed, they're not hurt, and they understand my reason for wanting to know. Because I knew it. Some people had received rejection, but I was just certain in my heart that they this would not happen. And you have to kind of hold that thought, I think, the whole time. And uh, so I, we got around to the conversation. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I just love that, that you did have that prayer, that you held that. You were so considerate. You know, and, and I do have so much compassion for all these people in this story. I mean, and you do too, Pat, even with, though it's, it's mm -hmm. so personal to you. And I just love that, how you were so considerate. Um, it, was, it was important to me that I treated them with respect because I was praying they would treat me with the same. Yeah. And it has to work both ways. Yes. But I, we got around to the, Daryl and I in the conversation got around to um, the part where I said, <clears throat> the only way for me to know if your uncle is my father is if you would take a DNA test, uh, then I would know you would be my cousin. And I said, would you be willing to do that if, if I sent you one? And he said, yes, I'd be willing to do that. He had no hesitation whatsoever. And um, he also told me that he had a brother, a younger brother, who would have also been younger than me, whose name is Daryl, I mean, uh, David, who lives in Nashville, right outside of Nashville. And he had an older half-brother named Don, uh, who wouldn't be related to me because he was Daryl and David's mom's mm -hmm. older child from her first marriage. But he would have been, if I had been in the family, he had been a stepbrother. My biological dad did adopt him. Mm -hmm. I'm getting off track here a little bit. But anyway, he took the test and... Uh, he sent it back immediately, and he was as excited as I was to get the results. And it, but it did not occur to him that I might be his sister until he talked to his younger brother. And David said, you know, Daryl, she might be our sister. Uh -huh. And Daryl said, well, you know, I hadn't thought of that. But he was not. He told me this is how kind he was. He told me that David said that. And he said, I'll be honest with you. Growing up, I never wanted a sister. In fact, I thought I had too many brothers. But he said, now the idea of having one is kind of sweet. I like it. <laughs> uh, what a sweetheart Daryl is, huh? That is awesome. He was so old. Yeah. yeah. And so we got... He was out. He got a, a a text saying he got an email or he got an email alert that he his results were in and he called me. He was out. He said, I just got an email. My results are in. I'm going home right now to open that email. And he got home and about a half an hour later, phone rang. I answered and he said, Well, he said, I opened this email and there's probably 900 people on this saying I'm related and I don't recognize a single name on here. And my heart just sank. Mm -hmm. And then he said, except for you, you're at the very top 
and it says, Patricia Ferguson, half sister. Half sister. And I just cried. I just cried. After 20 years, I finally knew it was just, it was such a weight, such a relief that I can't tell you how much. I, I will tell you what a mental and emotional relief it was um, during those 17 years, 18, 19, 20 years of looking. I had gained a tremendous amount of weight. I had developed diabetes and uh, my blood pressure was high uh, in the years. It's been almost a year since we found out. I have lost 85 pounds. <laughs> I, I no longer have to take my diabetes medication. I think my blood pressure is better. I haven't had it checked in a while. But things, the block that I had within my system has been relieved. Mm -hmm. And it's, Daryl and I have talked, actually we've emailed many times, well, every night. He e emails me every night and sometimes we talk on the phone. We have met for lunch and coffee and things like that. And next week, I'm going to meet my brother. It was supposed to be last week, and we had to change it. And so on July 9th, I'll meet David. David from Nashville. So, yes. That is wonderful. And what about Don? There's a uh, half-brother. Don is older. Daryl is older than me by two years, and Don is older than Daryl, I think, by five years. So Don's around 75, 76, something like that. He's in a nursing home, but uh, Daryl did, when COVID, li the restrictions lifted, he did go and visit. He told Don the story, and Don was just in awe of the whole thing but dave our daryl says now when he goes to see don don says how's our sister oh that's wonderful yeah so uh he's been very receptive too so i've been very lucky in that and i know how lucky i am not everyone will receive the same welcome that i did um and be given the same information. Like I went from a person who absolutely knew, knew nothing about my family on e either side to now I know on the Stewart side, I can trace my lineage back to the 1500s. Wow. That's how far that goes back. 1565, I believe it is. And on the other side, because I've been in there and, and seen some people and talked to them, I can go back even further. I know where my grandmother is buried on my mother's side. Uh, I know where her brothers are. There is information out there through DNA tests that if you take your time and don't give up, uh, you can find information if you're, if you're looking for it. And I would encourage anyone who's in a similar situation because DNA tests have made this information known to a lot of people who never suspected it. There are a lot of people who have taken a DNA test just to see what side of the ocean their family came from. And then they find out that the people they thought were their uh, biological parents or not. But no matter how long it takes, just keep praying that you don't have to know how the information gets to you just that it comes to you in some way. And when a lead does come, like an opening, when LaDonna sent me the BRCA2 email, that's a lead, take it and use it if you can, and just know that the information will come to you. And just be prepared to take whatever that is and know. 
my father, my biological father, passed in 2002. And so I didn't get to meet him. But um, everything I hear about him is that he returned to his family and was a great husband and dad. And for that, I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could have been, I could have found out other things, but it's just been a perfect revelation. And I do think that praying about it is a real good thing to do. That's, that's wonderful advice. It's wonderful advice. Yes. And your, your mother, she passed when? In 2010. She, she never re left the nursing home. Uh, and she died 10 years after she told me that. And often I, vis I visited three or four times a week. And I would, I would leave her with, uh, okay, sweet dreams and try to dream about who my father is. I'd asked her to do that, but she never, she never could put any more information out there. So what I found out, basically, I found out on my own. Oh, it's incredible how you found out and you persevered. 18, 19, or 20 years. And how was that relationship with you and your mom, you know, before she passed? I, I mean, you're such a beautiful lady. I'm sure that you had a lot of healing, but I'm just curious. Um, we were, we were absolutely fine. Um, there was not any change really in our relationship. After about the first two weeks, I was stunned for the first two weeks and I just didn't know what to say to her. I, you know, and I was a little, uh, perturbed, I guess. I, you know, she was helpless laying there, but I wanted to yell at her, but I know, knew I, I couldn't. <laughs> and so I didn't. And I eventually got over that. I had to get over that for myself as much as anything because of the incredible emotional and mental breakdown she had that put her in the nursing home. She, when she did come back, she was never quite the same. She was always a very soft spoken, uh, kind, kindly spoken woman. Uh, she was never quite the same when she, she came back. She was, uh, a little harsher in her comments and words. But there were occasional glimpses of her old self. And occasionally she would bring it up and say, you know, I just can't remember anymore. I know you're thinking about it. And I think she would bring it up in order to ask me the final question that always came when she did bring it up. I hope you don't hate me. No. You know, and I'd say, no, mama, I don't hate you. I love you. I, d I would like for you to remember but I don't hate you. He was a beautiful lady. She really was. And again, I just have so much compassion for, for everybody in the story. And I love how, you know, your brothers have welcomed you and you have like a new family pack. It's just wonderful. Yes. 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 I hope to meet um, my nieces. I want to meet David first and then meet my nieces and uh, nephews afterwards but that's why I haven't met them and they're all excited as well so I couldn't be more blessed in that respect yes. and so when you first met Daryl and then when you meet David did you cry when you first met him in person or did you hug how was how was that well it was during COVID and when we we met at a coffee shop outside and we both had masks on at first and uh when i saw him i i mean i'm short i'm five foot two and that was one thing through my whole life i could never figure out how my mother was five foot seven my dad was six foot two and how the tallest i have ever been is five foot two and that was stretching it a little bit and so why didn't I get at least my mother's height, you know, but I couldn't figure it out. Well, when Daryl got out of the car, I see that he was exactly the same height as I was. 
uh, he might have been an inch or two taller, but I could see that he was shorter. And he said our dad was shorter. And but we had the mask on, but we went to the table and we sat down. We hugged. I didn't cry, uh, but we did hug. Uh, I just didn't want to let him go for a minute, and he was he was very gracious. Uh, but we went and sat down, and so he took his mask off, and I took my mask off. And when I did, he said, "Oh my, you look exactly like our grandmother." Oh wow! And wow. I, I said, "Oh, he," because he had sent me pictures, and I had seen the resemblance myself. Because uh, he had sent me pictures of our dad, our grandmother and grandfather, and uh, Uncle James. And I had noticed immediately the resemblance between me and the grandmother. But I, I didn't know if my thinking that was reaching on my part, just me reaching. Uh, but when he got this kind of shocked look on his face and said, oh, my, <laughs> just like our grandmother. <laughs> so. You were, anyway, that I'm is, sorry. You were validated by his reaction. He validated. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it, that that was that was a good thing, and um, we talked for two hours there at Heine Brothers, and uh, then we met a couple other times. We met outside at places because of COVID, and uh, now we can we can meet. We had lunch oh, a few weeks ago and we were able to, uh, you know, sit outside, but we didn't have to wear our mask going in and that kind of thing. And uh, so it's, it's just been great to be able to uh, get to know him and who he is. And the nightly emails he sent, we don't talk about anything special. We just talk about mundane stuff. Every now and then we'll get into a political uh, discussion and and sometimes we're on the same side, sometimes we're not, you know, but we respect each other's opinion. So he's been just great to have in my life. That's wonderful. And you know, something we forgot to mention, you live in Louisville, Kentucky, and Daryl lives in Louisville, Kentucky. Yes. Which is yes. Yes. He, they uh they never moved out of louisville and so i could have uh he i went to western high school he went to southern high school and there's you know because of our closeness and age there are ways we could have crossed paths many times and in fact uh his uncle james lived in the neighborhood i grew up in oh wow mm -hmm. yeah and no. I didn't know that, of course. I think my my mother probably didn't know that either. <laughs> well, and I love your advice, you know, for people. And you kind of talk like, uh, I guess the, the DNA is fairly popular now. I know that. And you kind of talk like it's really not so unusual sometimes for people to find out that perhaps they have a biological family they didn't know about. No, it's not unusual. People are finding out more and more. Um, it's just so easy to find that out now, whereas before, a lot of that information just died with people who had it. And if you didn't say anything about it, <clears throat> no one knew. But now you can find out in different ways. And it's amazing the number of people since they found out my story who have come to me and said, you're not going to believe this. but I just found out that, you know, my dad is not my dad, or I just found out that I had two brothers that I didn't know about. So my dad had had another family that he didn't tell us about. Uh, it, it happens all the time, all the time. Well, I love your advice, you know, to be patient and, uh, and to take it into prayer. Do you have any other advice for the people? Oh, and you talked about, you know, you might not get such a welcoming, you know, you don't know the reaction, but do you have any other advice for all this? 
I, I just want, <clears throat> well, here's the thing. I, to keep that, that positive prayer, not to beg that people will be welcoming or respectful, but just to say thank you for knowing that they will be, be to be positive about it. Um, and to keep that thought that I'm open to information from any place, anyone, and I will look wherever I need to. And also, the most important thing to remember through going, going through all of this and the, the feelings that you have is that you are a worthy and special individual because of who you are, not because of who they are or how they're attached to you. You came here for a reason, and if the circumstances were not what the world thinks is normal, quote unquote, you are here for a reason. And if you don't know, or you don't know for a long time, it doesn't mean that you're not worthy, you're not special, and that you don't re deserve happiness, respect, and everything the good life is meant to give you. And so that is really important because a lot of people will take that information to heart and feel bad about themselves. But they are, regardless of who their parents are, even if their biological parents are their true biological parents, it is they who are worthy on their own, not because of any relation. I love that. Thank you, Pat. This has just been a wonderful interview. And you are a beautiful lady and I just love your story. You know, and you as well. We have so much courage, don't we? All of us. We're all so brave. We forget that, don't we? But thank yes. you so much. And uh, it's been great. I want to thank our listeners for joining us again. I always love to be with you. And please hit that subscribe button. Doesn't cost you anything. And we would love for you to visit the Hawks on the Wire again. If you have a story that you would love to share with the Hawks, go to 3hawkshaven.com and our Hawks on the Wire page and contact us with the email. We would love to hear from you. The Hawks would love to share your story. Thank you.